2 Samuel chapter 13 In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. She was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, Why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight, so that I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight, so that I may eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace. Go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread. But he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food here into my bedroom, so that I may eat it from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, Get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, Get this woman out of my sight and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing an ornate robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornate robe she was wearing. She put her hands on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious, and Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Two years later, when Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal Hazor, near the border of Ephraim, he invited all the king's sons to come there. Absalom went to the king and said, your servant has had shearers come. Will the king and his attendants please join me? No, my son, the king replied. All of us should not go. We would only be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he still refused to go but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon come with us. The king asked him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, so he sent with him Amnon and the rest of the king's sons. Absalom ordered his men, Listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, Strike Amnon down, then kill him,
Don't be afraid. Haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. Then all the king's sons got up, mounted their mules, and fled. While they were on their way, the report came to David, Absalom has struck down all the king's sons, not one of them is left. The king stood up, tore his clothes, and lay down on the ground, and all his attendants stood by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother, said, My lord should not think that they killed all the princes. Only Amnon is dead. This has been Absalom's express intention ever since the day that Amnon raped his sister Tamar. My lord the king should not be concerned about the report that all the king's sons are dead. Only Amnon is dead. Meanwhile, Absalom had fled. Now the man standing watch looked up and saw many people on the road west of him coming down the side of the hill. The watchman went and told the king, I see men in the direction of Horonaim on the side of the hill. Jonadab said to the king, See, the king's sons have come. It has happened just as your servant said. As he finished speaking, the king's sons came in, wailing loudly. The king, too, and all his attendants wept very bitterly. Absalom fled and went to Talmai, son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. But King David mourned many days for his son. After Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there for three years, and King David longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. 2 Samuel chapter 14 Joab, son of Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. So Joab sent someone to Tekoa, and had a wise woman brought from there. He said to her, Pretend you are in mourning. Dress in mourning clothes and don't use any cosmetic lotions. Act like a woman who has spent many days grieving for the dead. Then go to the king and speak these words to him. And Joab put the words in her mouth. When the woman from Tekoa went to the king, she fell with her face to the ground to pay him honor, and she said, Help me, your majesty. The king asked her, What is troubling you? She said, I am a widow. My husband is dead. I, your servant, had two sons. They got into a fight with each other in the field, and no one was there to separate them. One struck the other and killed him. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant. They say, Hand over the one who struck his brother down, so that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed. Then we will get rid of the heir as well they would put out the only burning coal I have left, leaving my husband neither name nor descendant on the face of the earth. The king said to the woman, Go home, and I will issue an order on your behalf. But the woman from Tekoa said to him, Let my lord the king pardon me and my family, and let the king and his throne be without guilt. The king replied, If anyone says anything to you, Bring them to me, and they will not bother you again. She said, Then let the king invoke the Lord his God to prevent the avenger of blood from adding to this destruction, so that my son shall not be destroyed. As surely as the Lord lives, he said, Not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. Then the woman said, Let your servant speak a word to my lord the king. Speak he replied. The woman said, Why then have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? When the king says this, does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought back his banished son. Like water spilled on the ground which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But that is not what God desires. Rather he devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. And now I have come to say this to my lord the king, because the people have made me afraid. Your servant thought, I will speak to the king, perhaps he will grant his servant's request, perhaps the king will agree to deliver his servant from the hand of the man who is trying to cut off both me and my son from God's inheritance. 
And now your servant says, May the word of my lord the king secure my inheritance, for my lord the king is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. May the Lord your God be with you. Then the king said to the woman, Don't keep from me the answer to what I am going to ask you. Let my lord the king speak, the woman said. The king asked, Isn't the hand of Joab with you in all this? The woman answered, As surely as you live, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from anything my lord the king says. Yes, it was your servant Joab who instructed me to do this, and who put all these words into the mouth of your servant. Your servant Joab did this to change the present situation. My Lord has wisdom like that of an angel of God. He knows everything that happens in the land. The king said to Joab, Very well, I will do it. Go, bring back the young man Absalom. Joab fell with his face to the ground to pay him honour, and he blessed the king. Joab said, Today your servant knows that he has found favour in your eyes, my lord the king, because the king has granted his servant's request. Then Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But the king said he must go to his own house, he must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. In all Israel there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot there was no blemish in him. Whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair once a year because it became too heavy for him, he would weigh it, and its weight was two hundred shekels by the royal standard. Three sons and a daughter were born to Absalom. His daughter's name was Tamar, and she became a beautiful woman. Absalom lived for two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab refused to come to him. So he sent a second time, but he refused to come. Then he said to his servants, Look, Joab's field is next to mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab did go to Absalom's house, and he said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? Absalom said to Joab, Look, I sent word to you, and said, Come here so that I can send you to the king to ask, Why have I come from Gishur? It would be better for me if I were still there. Now then, I want to see the king's face, and if I am guilty of anything, let him put me to death. So Joab went to the king and told him this. Then the king summoned Absalom, and he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. 2 Samuel chapter 15 in the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with fifty men to run ahead of him. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, What town are you from? He would answer, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, If only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me, and I would see that they receive justice. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way towards all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice, and so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. At the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. While your servant was living in Geshur in Aram, I made this vow. If the Lord takes me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. The king said to him, Go in peace. 
so he went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Two hundred men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahitophel, the Gilonite, David's counsellor, to come from Gilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's following kept on increasing. A messenger came and told David, The hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us, and put the city to the sword. The king's officials answered him, Your servants are ready to do whatever our lord the king chooses. The king set out, with his entire household following him. But he left ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out, with all the people following him, and they halted at the edge of the city. All his men marched past him, along with all the Carathites and the Pelathites, and all the six hundred Gittites who had accompanied him from Gath marched before the king. The king said to Ittai, the Gittite, Why should you come along with us? Go back and stay with King Absalom. You are a foreigner, an exile from your homeland. You came only yesterday. And today shall I make you wander about with us when I do not know where I am going? Go back and take your people with you. May the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. But Ittai replied to the king, As surely as the Lord lives and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king may be, whether it means life or death, there will your servant be. David said to Ittai, Go ahead, march on. So Ittai the Gittite marched on with all his men and the families that were with him. The whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley, and all the people moved on towards the wilderness. Zadok was there too, and all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God, and Abiathar offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. Then the king said to Zadok, Take the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it and his dwelling place again. But if he says I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Do you understand? Go back to the city with my blessing. Take your son Ahimahaz with you and also Abiathar's son, Jonathan. You and Abiathar return with your two sons. I will wait at the fords in the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar took the ark of God back to Jerusalem and stayed there. But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. Now David had been told Ahitophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahitophel's counsel into foolishness. When David arrived at the summit, where people used to worship God, Hushai the archite was there to meet him, his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, If you go with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, Your Majesty, I will be your servant. I was your father's servant in the past, but now I will be your servant. Then you can help me by frustrating Ahitophel's advice. Won't the priests Zadok and Abiathar be there with you? Tell them anything you hear in the king's palace. Their two sons, Ahimeah, son of Zadok, and Jonathan, son of Abiathar, are there with them. Send them to me with anything you hear. So Hushai, David's confidant, arrived at Jerusalem as Absalom was entering the city. 
John chapter 11 Now a man named Lazarus was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay ill, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, This illness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days, and then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odour, for he has been in there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, 
Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus. And as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. Psalm 111 Praise the Lord! I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures for ever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant for ever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established for ever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant for ever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Proverbs chapter 18 An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends and against all sound judgment starts quarrels. Fools find no pleasure in understanding but delight in airing their own opinions. When wickedness comes, so does contempt, and with shame comes reproach. The words of the mouth are deep waters, but the fountain of wisdom is a rushing stream. It is not good to be partial to the wicked, and so deprive the innocent of justice. The lips of fools bring them strife, and their mouths invite a beating. The mouths of fools are their undoing, and their lips are a snare to their very lives. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. One who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honour. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. 
The human spirit can endure in times of illness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it out. A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right, until someone comes forward and cross-examines. Casting the lot settles disputes and keeps strong opponents apart. A brother wronged is more unyielding than a fortified city. Disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. From the fruit of their mouth a person's stomach is filled. With the harvest of their lips they are satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. The poor plead for mercy, but the rich answer harshly. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother.